Well, good morning and welcome to another study. Uh, I invite you to join me in prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for all the things that you have done in our lives. And we are thankful that we are here this morning to open your word together. We are thankful for the way that you work upon our hearts in spite of our rebellion and our stubbornness. You are patient with us and you continue uh, to show us our need of you to see that we are sinners. We pray, Lord, that um, as we study together, that the light of your truth will shine upon our hearts and bring a conviction and the power to overcome the sin in our lives. We pray for each person searching for truth. We ask, Lord, that we can be a light in the darkness, that the light that shines upon us can, can reflect and that others can see uh, the truthfulness of the message that we give. Be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. And uh, we had finished off. We were um, on Thursday. We were addressing again uh, the two rivers. Now, um, I did find this quote. Let me see if I can find it here again. This is a quote from John Cummings uh, from a book called Prophetic Studies. And the, and the edition I had was 1853. I believe it was the ninth uh, edition or at least the ninth thousandth printing. printing. So there had been, um, they probably printed them in thousands or something like that. Um, and I did see an edition that was 1852. So... Um, so I don't know when it was originally published, but it's obviously Ellen White had access to this book because she's she's basically going to quote from it. Now, the quote that we use, uh, this letter 57, 1896, um, the light that Daniel received direct from God was given especially for these last days. The visions he saw by the banks of the Uli and the Hittico, the great rivers of Shinar, are now in process of fulfillment. And all the events foretold will soon have come to pass. So here is what she's quoting. So she, in the style of the day, isn't putting it in quotation marks. Uh, but she is obviously quoting him. Uh, so the first part is not a direct quote from him. Uh, again, not the least triumphant evidence of the inspiration. So this is this part she doesn't quote. But I'm going to read it just so you get the context. So this is John Cummings. Again, not the least triumphant evidence of the inspiration of the book of Daniel is its plain and obvious fulfillment. Part of it is fulfilled prophecy, and part of it, by its own statements and from its own internal allusions, is plainly unfulfilled prophecy. Uh, the portion of it which Daniel stated would be fulfilled within a given period has been completely fulfilled to the very letter. And that which remains to be fulfilled, we have the clearest evidence from the past and the present, will be fulfilled with equal certainty and equal precision. This vision which Daniel saw by the banks of the Uli and the Hittico, the two great rivers of the land of Shinar, has been partly fulfilled, uh, partly enlarged in the apocalypse, and now in course of fulfillment, and by and by, will be completely and perfectly accomplished. So, so when we, we take the statement of Ellen Weiss, we can see that she's quoting someone else, not word for word, um, basically paraphrasing what he says. Now, we know that um, this is really common at that time. Uh, you can actually see this if you look at some of these old commentaries. Sometimes you'll have, um, uh, for instance, Adam Albert Barnes, and Adam Clark, and you look at a verse and they'll say almost the identical thing um, uh, about a verse, they'll have the same comments. And so you can see that uh, 
one of them is quoting the other, whichever one's first, I can't remember. Um, and you'll see this with other commentators. They will, they're commenting on the Bible, they've read the other commentary, and they're basically just going to copy what the other person said. And no copyright is being infringed. Um, and no, no um, quotation marks and no reference to who they're quoting. Um, and especially in biblical uh, writings, it was seen that you could copy what other people said because this is the Bible. It wasn't sort of a, uh, you know, if you were saying something that wasn't really completely unique um, that anybody could say, there would be no reason to reference someone. And, and probably the person that you were quoting was already quoting someone else. Um, sometimes they might say that they're quoting somebody if that person is considered an authority. And so they would quote them for that reason alone, sort of to have force to their argument. Um, or to maybe show uh, where that opinion came from that they don't agree with, they might put it in quotes, uh, but just to allow other people to know um, uh, that somebody else said something that they don't quite agree with. But, but anyway, um, so when we look at, at statements like this, and we talked about how the Uli is actually uh, a ri river that um, actually where it empties into uh, uh, the Persian Gulf is, is really not very far from where the Tigris and Euphrates empty. I mean, the Tigris and Euphrates at the present time, uh, they join before they enter, empty into the Persian Gulf. And that wasn't always the case. Uh, but this other river enters not far away. I mean, they're can't remember how far it is it's some miles but it's not like it's going at a completely different location it's definitely going into the same body of water and in jeff's um statement he talks about uh emptying into two different bodies of water but i think he's speaking metaphorically there um but i'm not sure because even the euphrates and the tigris i mean they join together so um so I'm not sure what he was referring to there. Now, when we're taking this, um, this statement, we're, um, the reason why we talk about the doubling is has to do here with the two rivers here in Othniel. And how are we going to take this, the story of Othniel then, and understand this having to do with um, what Jeff was saying in the Time of the End magazine. How are we doing this? What, what are we looking at? We're looking at this message that comes from Mesopotamia, right? This, that this is who Israel is in captivity to. So who is the church, the Adventist church, at 9-11, who are they in captivity to? And how do we understand this regarding this, this doubling uh, that's occurring here? When we say that they're in captivity to Rome. Okay. Um, right. So, so because we have here Babylon, right? So if we're saying that the Adventist church is in captivity to Rome, uh, how would we how would we demonstrate that what what aspect of that would we see is it some particular doctrine uh, is it somehow how the church operates and and what do we mean by that specifically acceptance of spiritual formation okay so spiritual formation okay and and so this has to do with um, a doctrine that comes from Rome that is spiritualism, right? Correct. Spiritual Correct. formation is spiritualism. It it is idolatry, but it's taken on a new form. Now it is the Protestant churches that are demanding that the Adventist Church adopt spiritual formation so that their ministers can be certified, right? Now, why would Seventh-day Adventist ministers need to be uh, 
qualified by the Protestant churches. Funding and acceptance. Okay, funding. Well, I don't know if there's any funding that comes from them. Okay, but acceptance. Uh, reputation. <laughs> they don't so, want to be looked at as a, as a, um, a cult. Right. So they want to be accepted because they want to have the, their their papers and their articles and their scholarship to be accepted. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, these are ministers. These aren't necessarily theologians. Um, now, we know that, um, you know, you can have non-Adventist ministers speaking in Adventist churches and vice versa. Um, and I don't necessarily have a problem with somebody speaking in an Adventist church if they have, I mean, they may belong to another church, but if they have a message to share that is, you know, truth, I mean, maybe there's a point for that, uh, because, you know, we have lay people and, and there could be people who ended up believing in something that Adventism has to believe in or, or whatever. But often what they're doing is they're just bringing in uh, error, you know. So, um, I mean, the closest that we've had to that in Warburg Church is we've had, you know, the people from uh, um, the Bible Society come and speak uh, about promoting uh, you know, Bibles or something like that, which... I wasn't particularly a fan of, even though I used to sit on the board of the Northern Alberta Bible Society. Um, I wasn't really a fan of having them come in and speak at our church, but somebody arranged that. I don't know who did. But, you know, I'm generally not a fan of that. But anyway, we know that there is this alliance with the churches of the world. And, and this has begun a long time ago. And it's just become accepted. And so what happened in 2001 wasn't particularly shocking to anyone at the time. I, don't, I think it totally went under the radar. I don't know of anybody who was opposed to it at the time. Um, I know prior to that, there was um, neurolinguistic programming. And one of the guys who was leading in opposing what was happening with neurolinguistic programming who exposed it was a guy named Jeff Rich, who was a friend of mine. He runs uh, Layman Ministry News out of Idaho, uh, northern Idaho, um, St. Mary's, Idaho is where he lives. And um, now he's sort of backed down on a lot of these things that he used to teach. He's much more liberal than he used to be. But um, neurolinguistic programming was noted. And of course, uh, uh, was it John Osborne was also uh, speaking out against it back in the early 90s. But with spiritual formation, I didn't hear anything about it until actually I was in this movement. So, so these things have come in, and in some ways, uh, they've been very insidious within Adventism. I mean, people have commented uh, yesterday about you know, what we see in our Sabbath school quarterlies, how we have um, lots of statements from non-Adventist authors. And I've never really been a, a fan of that. I mean, maybe they have something to say, but I don't think we should. Entertain it? Yeah, I mean, most of, if you read these books, but if you go to the ABC, you're going to find more books by non-Adventist authors now. Uh, than by Adventist authors and, and lots of stuff that's complete error, all kinds of spiritualism and self-help stuff that's uh, total nonsense. So, you know, this, this movement has been raised up to bring us back to the foundation of Adventism. And so the, we, we've talked about Othniel. Othniel represents the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing uh, this light and 9-11 and is going to be that event that does wake up Adventists, at least startles them out of their slumber for a moment. Many of them uh, 
roll over and go back to sleep. But there's definitely a lot of people who were awoken, awakened by what happened at 9-11 and began to study. And our movement is part of that. So when we look at what Jeff was talking prior to 9-11 in the Time of the End magazine, um, how do we relate that then to what's happening here with the fact, I mean, the simple fact that when we're taking the judges, the first judge is Othniel, right? That's the first judge. And does that relate to what Jeff did in the Time of the End magazine? Dealing with the first article, the, the tale of the two rivers. Yes. Okay. So, so we can connect this. And so Othniel, I mean, we're going to put right at 9-11. That is the message that Jeff had um, prepared that was um, formalized is going to be empowered here, right? That's what we're saying. Correct. Okay. So when we... Um, so when we go to this chart, just to flip back here. So what we're saying is that Othniel arrives at 9-11. That is, this is a new line, but this new line is just the line of the judges. And so we're putting it on a line. But really, Othniel is the empowerment of the first angel. Because 1996 is the formalization of that. And Othniel then, if we're going to take his line it's going to be starting at the empowerment of the first angel 9-11 right it's not the arrival of the second angel 9-11 that's that is <clears throat> happening here it is the empowerment of that right so we have 9-11 has some symbols yeah okay, okay so you're showing on on this chart you're showing othniel as being the arrival of the first angel, but you're also stating that it's the empowerment of the first angel. Right. So he's the, because it's a different line. Right. So, so we can say that because what we're doing here is we're taking these first three judges. So if we go um, back here on the judges line, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar are the arrival of the first angel in the judges line. Right? That's what we're saying. So this is the bigger line. They're the arrival of the first angel. All three of these, right? Because in this um, in this line, we have um, all of the judges. And, and this line here is going to go from 9-11 to 2023. But each one of these waymarks has its own line. So even if we just look at this, we can say Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar are the arrival of the first angel at 9-11. And, um, but this is, this 9-11 here, we, we've discussed whether this is the arrival of the second angel that's being marked, or is it the empowerment of the first angel? And, and we flipped back and forth regarding this, right? So what are we zoomed into with this first angel arriving? And if we if we look at this, um, like there's when when we get through this line, we can see that this judge's line pulls together both 911s. And and the way that we sort of look at it, and, and I still haven't figured out exactly how to express it. But we're going to see that the empowerment of the first angel here is 11.9. That's Gideon's message, right? But we've already connected 11.9 to 9.11. And so in some ways, this line, this whole line, is about the arrival of the second angel, right? That is, if we take this whole judge's line, this is really about the second angel's message. I mean, it's 
the arrival of the second angel in our history. Right, because that's how we're going to attach this. We're going to say that this line is an expansion of 9-11, but 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel. But we know 9-11 is a singular event. But when we look at Othniel himself as a judge, he's going to symbolize the empowerment of the first angel. Right. Does that make sense? Does it does it make sense to people what I'm saying? I think it's logical. OK. Well, if it's logical, hopefully it makes sense then. <laughs> yeah. So so we can see because of what has happened before and the message of Othniel is definitely an empowerment of what Jeff put in the Time of the End magazine. Even though Jeff didn't completely anticipate this because he's looking for the Sunday law, but we know that the entire line of the judges is a zoom into the arrival of the second angel and the arrival of the second angel is the Sunday law, right? But it... it as we know, it happens progressively. But first, you need the empowerment of the first angel. And if we just look at our normal line, and and we we just if we just thought nine eleven was a way mark that only represented one thing, um, it would have to be the empowerment of the first angel, and then the second angel arriving would be some other event. But we know the second angel arrives at nine eleven too, and so this has been a problem because we say, well, how can we have this one event be two different way marks and that's because we're on on different lines and and now we understand that when we zoom into a way mark that way mark is going to be a reform line so that's what we're doing here with othniel ehud and shamgar so even though this is the empowerment of the first angel othniel is uh this line is going to uh, expand. And this is all, all going to be the empowerment of the first angel, but it has its own reform line. And so we put, there's this increase of knowledge after 9-11, and this is going to be about 9-11, and this is going to be ozone, right? So this is where they have now presented the formalized message is a presentation of a message. This is the ozone camp meeting. We now have an understanding about 9-11. Not complete, but it's the understanding of 9-11 that's needed at that time that had arrived because of 9-11. And so this is the method message of Othniel. It's the work of the Holy Spirit um, to bring about repentance and confession, right? But it's, it's this first message. Now, we can see that Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar all arrive at 9-11, but now we're going to expand them out. And so that word may be where people have problems because we know that they're they're three separate judges and if they all arrive at 9 11 how come we're we're having ehud arriving then later and shamgar later right because we're saying they're all three but this is like um um, um the first angel's message fear god give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come well in that first angel's message arriving in 1798, all three messages are embodied in that first arrival, correct? Correct. Yeah. So we should have no problem taking this Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar and seeing them as a reform line. Now, this reform line then is going to be preparatory to what's going to happen in the movement. So, so when we look at ozone, uh, this is a formalization. We have to see, well, what is the empowerment of this message? So um, I'm just going to move this over here. So what is, 
So we have ozone, that's the formalization. Well, where is the empowerment of this message about 9-11, right? So that's the next step. And then we're gonna see that Ehud is also, um, that we're saying that it is a message dealing with the 2520. Right, so we're gonna have something here. And then there's gonna be a formalization of that message, right? So I'm just putting all these things here. And when would that be? And then we would have uh, the empowerment of that. And when would that be? And then we would have the arrival of the third message. And when would that be? And if this is embodied by Shamgar, we already understand that this is a message regarding July 18th and chronology, right? So, so this is, uh, and the way that we put it in this line above is we had 2005 and 2014. So we're saying that Ehud is actually, um, you know, the message dealing with the 2520 and that's going to be 2005. And then Shamgar is going to be 2014, the message dealing with chronology. So we've already sort of put it in here, but it's all a part of this increase of knowledge of this bigger line, right? Which we call a judge's line. So it's, it's going to be about a message. And there's a preparatory aspect to the message of July 18th, which has to do with the chronology. So in 2014, um, that's when I end up figuring out this whole thing of structure prophetic chronology. I mean, the way that this happens is, I mean, basically for a few months, that's all I'm doing is chronology while I'm asleep and while I'm awake, other than that I'm, you know, teaching guitar. But even then I'm thinking about chronology all the time. And I end up getting basically all of this structure uh, that then in uh, October 13th, 2018, all comes together. So there's this um, increase of knowledge that this judge's line is addressing. And the judge's line is addressing, what it is addressing is time in this movement, right? So, so we can see that the judge's line is about time. Now, we're not always going to have time that is, we're not, you know, looking for a date for the Sunday law or a date for uh, the close of probation or the loud cry or the outpouring of the, the, the latter rain in, in its fullness or any of these things, right? So God gave us this time and it, and it happened within this line. And for a reason, that is because the enemies that existed in the land, God had to use what he had available uh, to correct um, this movement. And, and, and this movement then is going to be a part of a bigger line, an increase of knowledge in correcting the Adventist church, right? Not the institution, but the members, the Levites, as we call them. So, so this is all very logical. Like everything that we're seeing here is logical and consistent. But it is, there are pieces that we don't know exactly how they fit. But we can see that the judge's line gives us this much clearer picture of what this movement is about and what has happened to us, what it is we have experienced. Now, I mean, as we've mentioned before, we're going to, we're planning a camp meeting, which we're going to have is uh, right now we're deciding it's going to be the the last full week of July this summer and and this is what we're going to pre present we're going to present these lines dealing with the judges line and each of the judges so it's it's you know obviously in a one week camp meeting it's pretty tough to do um uh you know, Stephen's going to deal with the chronology of the judges and a lot of the details about this history. And, and the idea is that we need to have these judges fixed in our minds. That is, we need to know the story of the judges, um, who they are, what they did, and, and all of the symbols that are in this history. 
and be able to, to recognize that this is our history from 9-11 to 2023, right? We also have, of course, that April 5th, 2030 date and the other uh, days of atonements and different dates. We don't know what those things mean, but we do know that they tie all of this history together, that without 2030, April 5th, 2030, we wouldn't really have evidence for what we're talking about here with these judge with the judge's line, because these things have come about as a result of understanding April 5th, 2030. And so that's going to also have to be a part of, of what this is, what this, what this presentation is. Okay. So, so when we go to Ehud now, so we, we can see we've spent a lot of time on Othniel. So when we go uh, to Ehud, well, well, I guess the thing that we have to finish is, when is this message uh, empowered? So uh, I forgot that part of it. So how do, we, how do we take this from the story of Othniel? Um, because here uh, it says in verse 10, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel and went out to war and the Lord delivered Cush, Cushan Rishathayim, king of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia into his hand and his hand prevailed against Cushan Rishathayim. So when did this happen? So if we're going to put that on a line, what what event regarding this movement would we use? And and I would think, you know, we'd look at a camp meeting. So why would I put Oklahoma 2010? Haven't got a clue, bro. <laughs> okay, so this is the prophetic chain. Uh, this is, um, uh, I guess, at that point, it's the biggest camp meeting that that they're going to have. Um, it's not technically an FFA camp meeting because it's not put on by FFA. FFA is invited to it, so Jeff's invited to this camp meeting. Though um, we have all these other ministries, so we have a ministry from France, um, we have all, all the different American ministries that existed at that time that were part of this movement. Um, now also, I'm at that camp meeting, so um, I think that's important when you're going to look at uh, what's going to follow. But in this camp meeting, the prophetic chain, uh, what we're studying right here is the prophetic chain. Isn't that what we began to study when it came to understanding the lines? Now, somebody may have another suggestion. Now, part of the problem we would have here has to do with Ehud as being the 2520. But if we're going to put Ehud here as the 2520, uh, when are we going to mark that? And, and maybe somebody may think that there needs to be some other thing, you know, that Oklahoma would represent something else. Brother. Yeah. Um, Theodore. It, um... Is that um, 
Oklahoma meetings, are they put online or or are they online anywhere where you can go back and reference? Because I didn't know what y'all was teaching back then in the Oklahoma meetings. Well, it's the Prophetic Change series. Um, I mean, you used to be able to access it at the Seven Thunders website, but I don't think so anymore. The Seven Thunders is not longer um, on. Right. So it would just be something that you would have to have the the CD, uh, not the CD ROM, but the, um, the hard drive, where they put all the different meetings. So, okay. I mean, uh, we could put those up at because uh, you don't have those up, do you, Iran, at uh, the horizontal tree? Not that I, I don't know. I don't have it. Yeah. Okay. But but we do have those meetings somewhere. I don't know if we have all of them though, because um, you know they probably just put Jeff's meetings there on on the you know because they sort of deleted all these other ministries that left. So I don't know. Um, but I, I mean, I was there, so I, I saw all the meetings. I could tell you what it's about. You can also read the notes. Um, I kind of but- remember going over that study a long time ago when I first got involved with this. Mm-hmm. I just don't have in my memory all the details. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to put the arrival as of... Ehud as the arrival of the second angel, and I'm going to put him at Oklahoma 2010 as well. So why would I do that? Do I have any precedent for doing this? Well, you have uh, um, 9-11 twice. Okay. But yeah. I, that's a precedent, I would imagine. Yeah, that is the precedent. And And when we look at what happened in Oklahoma 2010, it's basically um, the summation of the message. Now, you know, I know at some point we need to put Habakkuk's two tables in here, but I'm going to deal with that as the formalization. So, um, so that that's going to be 2012. All right, so that's going to be the two tables. Um, Okay, and so I'm just kind of going ahead here. So this is going to be Ehud is the arrival of this message. And this is going to be about the 2520. And and in a a simplified way, that's how we looked at Ehud. And we're going to look at Ehud in a bit more detail. Then we're going to have the two tables. And then we're going to have some other event here. So we have to figure out what that is. And, and so we have to look at he, Ehud to, to understand that. But this we're going to compare to the empowerment. And this is uh, the spirit uh, coming upon Ehud, right? He's going to deliver them. And that's what I believe that message at um, in 2010 is. But it's going to be opposed. So Jeff goes to war, the Holy Spirit, but Jeff is part of that. And when he when he deals with 2010, we're going to see the results of that unfold. That is, you're going to have a separation that occurs in the movement. Right, so this is is going to progress. 
And what Jeff tried to do is he included the different speakers. He basically gave them assignments on what to present. And uh, they rebelled against that. Right, because they felt that that Jeff was in, in in Jeff including them, they took in the opposite sense as trying to control them. Right. Anybody know about that history? Of, of Not that how they interpreted it. They interpreted it as Jeff was trying to control them. You know the kingly power thing. How dare he tell us? what to, to to preach right that was part of their complaint in 2014 they looked back at that history and interpreted it that way but jeff wasn't seeing it that way at all he was looking at you know we're all together let's let's do some presentations that are going to help expand our understanding of these things he didn't you know write out their sermons for them he just gave them a topic and of course, they rebelled against that, right? So, so he they, gave them assignments, is what he assignments. did. Yeah, he gave them assignments, right? And of course, they didn't like that. You know, whether they, you know, they whether they expressed it at the time or not, I could actually see that uh, there was some rebellion going on in some of the speakers, and and some of them thought they were pretty special, but Jeff wasn't one of those. Uh, one of the speakers, you know, he would always come in late and he didn't do any socializing. He would arrive, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, this prima donna or something like that, go up there and deliver his presentations. And, um, and, and, and you could see that he thought he was something. He was a star. Right. Yeah. That's how some people looked at this type of, of thing. And there's, you know, there's people who still think, you know, that, you know, that there's somehow something very special, you know, about being like doing a, a presentation or being a leader, you know, so to speak. Um, some people want to have the limelight, but they don't realize the weighty responsibility that comes to those types of, of positions. It's not something you really, you don't really want to be in that, given that responsibility. Right. I agree. And, and people often don't handle it well because they want to have the limelight, but they don't really want the responsibility. Um, that is, they think they can handle it, but they don't know what it really means. And, you know, you, you see this not just in religion, you see it in all kinds of areas. People often can't handle um, being given uh, responsibility. As opposed to humbly um not wanting to do it because they feel they're less than worthy yeah sometimes you just have to do things yes sir right um, sometimes you have to do things it doesn't matter uh what your actual feelings are you just do it yeah yeah it's like me running a guitar store i'm a terrible boss um because i don't i don't you know i don't like telling people what to do so I ended up doing a lot of the work myself just because, yeah, I don't want to boss people around. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, but you have to learn how to delegate. Yeah, it's tough things. Well, it, it's not so much that I know how to delegate. The problem is if somebody doesn't want to do it, I'm not going to make them. Right? I'm feeling you. Yeah, like I hired an employee so that I could have more free time. Uh, but he didn't want to work the hours that that I needed him to work so that I could have free time. So I ended up, you know, it just became an expense. It didn't really help me at all. So, um, so, you know, those are the things that happen. Anyway, we can see that what was happening in this movement um, back at that time we can see how oklahoma is is pivotal as a camp meeting because one is it's where all these 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 ministries come together but the holy spirit working through jeff in a sense is going out to war and he's battling these forces 
the Holy Spirit is um, using Jeff. And, and in the end, it's going to end up conquering this, this enemy, right? Now then Ehud, which is also a message that arrives at Oklahoma, which we will call the second angel's message. And we can see, of course, too, that there's, there's a connection here because, I mean, the second angel's message is a call to come out of Babylon. So you can see how Oklahoma would fit both of these. Now, when we looked at Ehud, we know that this is a, not the enemy of Mesopotamia. This is actually an enemy that is, is still there, this Eglon king of Moab, right? And he gathers unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of the palm trees. City of the palm trees is? Jericho. Jericho. And Jericho is? Symbol of the seven times, right? Right. Right. Okay. And so the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. So, so this is another aspect of a message that has been the enemy has possessed, right? He, the enemy possesses the 2520. So, and we're saying Ehud represents the 2520, and, and probably what we could do is we could do a reform line for Othniel, a reform line for Ehud, and a reform line for Shamgar. Shamgar doesn't give us a lot of information, um, but we can see that they all do represent this. So I'm, I'm sure that we could take a reform line for Othniel, a reform line for Ehud, and a reform line for Shamgar, but we're not going to do that at this time. Okay. Okay, I've got a, I have a strange question. Okay. You've got in Judges 3.14, the statement, so the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. Mm -hmm. Is there anything significant about 18? Well, there's lots of things significant about 18, but what particular thing are you thinking of? I mean, here we have the seven times and then we have 18 and you can see seven and 18 together. Um, if you reverse the numbers, you have 81. Okay. And what did Elder Jeff say about 81? Well, it represents midnight. Okay. So is, is this situation where the children of Israel were serving the king of Moab, 18 years, is this another symbol of a midnight occurrence? Well, um, no. Um, okay. and, and the reason why is, is because this is the enemy that exists, right? So the children of Israel under, under oppression. So again, see, that's why if we take Ehud as a, um, a reform line itself, we would see this is the period of darkness. But remember, darkness exists all throughout a reform line because these reform lines progress and each reform line has its own particular period of darkness. But each of the messages also because each of the way marks can be a reform line. There's also a period of darkness here. So um, when I look at um, this as the arrival of the second angel, right? So when we, when we go on this line here again, um, and I say this is Oklahoma, um, this is a message regarding the 2520. So this is where I'm first going to be exposed. I mean, they didn't talk about the 2520 in Oklahoma other than in passing, right? So, um, but this is where I'm exposed to the movement that's, that's about the 2520. And I had conversations about the 2520. But here, I don't understand 
the 2520. I have no idea what it is, other than it's a period of 25, 20 years from 677 to 1844. That's all I know about it. I didn't even know about Hiram Edson's 2520 at this point. So I only knew about Miller's 2520. And, you know, James White's article, um, I don't even know if I knew about that at that point. I did read everything in 2010, prior to going to the Oklahoma camp meeting, we had uh, uh, Dwayne Lemon, you know, uh, telling us about how he had Lyme's disease. But he also told us about uh, um, this 2520 movement. And um, so that actually intrigued me because I knew that this camp meeting I was going to, they had something to do with this number. And so I started reading up on what it says on the EG White disc, um, the pioneers about the 2520. So I knew about the 2520 prior going to Oklahoma camp meeting, um, just in, in a very general sense. But if we're gonna put this as a rival that Ehud's about the 2520, um, we know that, that, that we're under this oppression Right, so the, the oppression that we're under, that the movement is still under when Ehud arrives is uh, the king of Moab. So what is the king of Moab um, addressing? Right, so, so we know who Moab is, right? Right? So that's going to be um, from an incestuous relationship that he's the son of Lot. Right, So this is an enemy that's oppressing them, that they didn't conquer. It's also one that is supposed to be, quote, family. Right. So when I look at the 2520, I mean... We, we see that something had been left over. Uh, and, and, and normally they're going to appeal to this supposedly James White's article, which is actually Uriah Smith's article. I mean, that's going to be their main line of defense. Uriah Smith's footnote in Daniel and the Revelation and uh, Uriah Smith's article that is attributed to James White, January 23rd, 1864, right? I think I got the date right for that. Uh, I believe you're correct. Yeah. So, so this is going to be their main artillery, right? And so I'm going to be studying this at this time, um, trying to understand what's what's going on. I mean, uh, when I when I get back from the camp meeting in Oklahoma, talk to people in church. Um, actually, that Christmas I did a sermon. So after I got back from Oklahoma, because that was in November, and then I did a sermon, um, I think Christmas Day or Christmas Eve or something. Let me see here. Let's see when that sermon was. Uh, 2010. Yeah, it's going to be Christmas Day. Um, so that's going to be... Um, I guess that would be my um, think here, 28th um, anniversary of my baptism. Um, so anyway, I, I present this sermon on the Millerites and the disciples and actually use uh, some of the PowerPoints that were being used by um, uh, these other ministries. So I ended up getting a, a copy of the PowerPoints that were being used. So I'm going to use these PowerPoints in my, my sermon. Uh, uh, so it's the first time I ever used a PowerPoint. I was terrible at it. But, um, but anyway, so we're, we're going to have this, this increase of light uh, that comes in connection with the arrival of a message. Now, 
so a lot of this for me is 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 rather personal too so i take though that the message of ehud dealing with the 2520 is um in our movement we're now going to have an expansion of light regarding the 2520 now also in 2010 we have parminder presenting the 2520 now now it might have started at the end of 2009 but most of his presentations, I believe, were done in 2010. And, and I'm not even sure that they started in 2009, but maybe they did. Um, it's Tess who's going to put them in 2009 for chronological reasons. And I don't know if she's correct, but uh, these are presentations that Parminder is going to do at, um, at Jeff's, right, in 2010. And they go, they, I saw them on the Seven Thunders website. And there's 20 presentations on the 2520. So we have that in 2010. We also have in 2010, um, Johannes Koletsky's um, study on, um, the stu on Joseph and the structural chiasm there that gives us um, a second witness, so to speak, for the 2520. That is, you can present the 2520 for Northern Israel from the story of Joseph without referencing Leviticus 26 or any of these controversial things. And you can show the two 2520s. So there's a lot that happens in 2010 in relationship to the 2520. It's also in 2010, really, that the 2520 uh, starts to be talked about now you know it's like when you buy a car and all of a sudden you see that car everywhere so maybe that's part of it um you know so once that, my attention was drawn to the 2520 obviously i'm going to notice this but we had a speaker in warburg church come to our fall convocation speaking about this error of the 2520 and and this is the year that the 2520 becomes this big issue, right? Now it's gonna to continue to grow. So we're gonna have, um, now I put here the two tables and you know, probably what we, you know, what we have to decide is whether the two tables are gonna go here or whether they even go anywhere in this line or you have here, uh, because they're kind of tied together. What else happens in 2012? Or is it in 2011? When, do, when is the disfellowship happen, Dwight? I'd have to go back and look, but it, it occurs somewhere about mid-year. I'll get, I'll get the information. Well, it's in February that there's the stuff's going on. I always forget whether that's 2011 I have, a, I believe it's 2011. In the so 2011 is going to be. Um, this fellowship of who? Well, people who believe at Newport. Yeah, this oh, is going right. to be Newport. Is I think it's 2012. It's 2012. Newport is. That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. So 2012. So I don't know if we can put this all as one. Newport's one word, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have the two tables, and maybe we could just put 2012 there, Newport, the two, the two tables, presentations. It, okay. Yes, it was 2012, and it would have been sometime about February because Jeff came up and gave a presentation on April 27th of 2012. Okay. Okay, we'll do that April 27th. At least that's what I've got for the, the time that I received those presentations. Yeah. Okay, so we're just kind of putting this stuff up tentatively. Whether that's a formalization or, or an empowerment. Now, Jeff is going to be starting uh, Habakkuk's two tables um, around that time. Uh, I know that the First, when they first posted the two tables, uh, the first date that they had when they've taken them down and put them up again, 
but originally it was June 22nd, 2012. Why is that number familiar? Or why is that date familiar? Yeah, I know. So, so I'm going to put that here, June 22nd, even though I believe that the meeting was a different day. Um, but I'm going to put June 22nd, 2012. So, because that's when they first posted it, the first, the first presentation. So why it took them a while to post probably had to do with uh, the whole issue of how, you know, familiar they were with the technology and using YouTube. Maybe they hadn't used YouTube before and they decided to use YouTube. I don't know. But that's when they first post the two tables, June 22nd. Um, now, in the two tables, of course, Jeff is going to review all of the history of the movement at that time. But I, I put the two tables, I would think that this probably rather, it, whether it's a formalization or empowerment, I don't know. But there's also other things going on, right? So this is a very rich history. Um, but these are things we can nail down with a specific date. And then we, we have to look at what Shamgar is going to represent. Now, the story of Ehud, of course, is rather complex. So um, I, I should show you the screen. Here's what I've drawn. <clears throat> so you can see what I have here. Oklahoma 2010, that's this, you know, we're putting it as the arrival of the second angel and Ehud, obviously, if we put him on a reform line, um, he would have uh, this connection to, uh, you know, 2005 when Jeff had marked. So when Jeff looked at Newport, he looked at it has been seven years since he had presented the 2520. So so he, he put that as 2005 when he first presents it. And, um, and I'm trying to remember if that's in the beginning of the year, the end of the year, I don't remember. Uh, but then when he looks at 2012 and he talks about uh, Newport um, and it's gonna be Newport, is it New Hampshire? I can't remember. It's another new port. That's where the charts are first, the 1863 chart is first going to be presented at a camp meeting in Newport. I used to always think it was Rhode Island, but I think it's Newport, New Hampshire or something like that, um, wherever that Newport is. And um, and then he- I thought it was on the West Coast. It's gonna be on the East Coast. Is and it? the Newport's on the West Coast. And he did the same thing with Ellen White with her first open vision and her last open vision. It was Portland, Maine was her first open vision. And her last open vision was Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Right. So he, can, right. he had been teaching this for a long time. So when the Newport came up, he, he paralleled this so that we could connect the 1863 chart, which didn't directly have the 2520 on it. It does indirectly and actually the entire prophetic mirror, but he, he connects this to the rejection of the 2520. And um, so, so it, as a formalization of the 2520, um, is, it, is it best to take Jeff's presentation on April 27th um, as a symbol of this? Now, we can also see the doublings here in the sense of Newport, Oregon, and Newport, uh, whatever, it's New Hampshire, I think. Um, and also the two tables are a doubling, right? The June 22nd um, date being also a doubling in and of itself. And we know that in Millerite history, we have Samuel Snow with his Pentecost letter that's published five days later. And that if you double the date that it's published on the biblical calendar, you get 20 seconds. So it's published on the biblical calendar on the 11th day of the third month. And it was written on the sixth day of the third month. And so you can see the doublings that are there. Uh, so, 
So anyway, hopefully this is making sense to people, but this is, you know, this is how we're looking at it, whether this is correct or not. Now, so we're going to have Moab. We're going to have this 18 years of progress of, of, um, of oppression. Now, remember with the children of Israel cried to the Lord and the Lord raised them up a deliverer. Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, Benjamite, a let man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did it under his raiment upon his right thigh. So when we look at this, we have okay on June twenty-second. There's a question there on June twenty-second, two thousand twelve. The first of the Habakkuk's two tables was published on YouTube. Now they've since taken that down and re put them up on YouTube, but originally that was the date that we had. And that date was a symbolic date for FFA being um, the date in 2011, where Jeff first received money for starting the school of the prophets, $165,000. And also, um, that their first camp meeting in 2014 in Arkansas was on June 22nd. And the center date of that is uh, December 21st, 2012. So if you go between that 2011 date, June 22nd, and the 2014 date, June 22nd, the center is December 21st, 2012. And that's the beginning of that, or where we have the hundred and what 1,872,000 days of the Mayan calendar come to that point, right? So anyway, there's significance in that June 22nd. It's also the center of the 777 chiasm, chiastic structure. Thank uh, you. June 22nd, 2017. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So we have this dagger, right? Um, now this is... Uh, the word can mean drought, but also a cutting instrument from its destructive effect as a knife, a sword, or other sharp instrument. Um, and it has two edges. So we have a doubling there, right? It's a two-edged sword. Right. And we have a cubit. The cubit is 18 inches or 21 inches. Yeah, that's and more of a short sword, not necessarily a dagger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a short sword, 18 inches, you know, so, so the thing about a cubit that's interesting is we also have July 18th and July 21st, right, connected with that 18 and 21. So, I mean, this would probably be an 18 inch cubit, it wouldn't be the sanctuary cubit. Um, but we've already had 18 there, the 18 years, and so we're going to have this, this sword. And, and so the measurement here, these ideas of these measurements... Uh, become symbolic in reference to uh, spans of time, right? Yes, that's what we've concluded. Yeah. Now he girds it under his raiment, so it's something that's hidden, and upon his right thigh. And he brought, brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal. So remember, this goes over to Gilgal. And Gilgal then we, we used at the beginning of Judges as representing 9-11, right? Because that's the I mighty call. Yeah, right? Now he's going to go and he's going to go and he's going to see these idols, right? So these the idea of these quarries, that's where they're going to have these carved graven images, and then, so then he's going to turn back and he says, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. And the king says, keep silence. And, um, and all that were around the king, they go out and they let Ehud uh, talk to the king alone, right? And then Ehud is, um, now this whole thing about the summer parlor we went through as well. Um, and so there's lots of symbolism. I don't want to go through everything here. But he's going to thrust him into the belly, right, with this 
uh, this sword and also the haft that is the handle went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and of course the dirt comes out so um so his guts or spills his guts there and then ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them and so we could see these doors represent of course this chiasm because these are double doors and it's plural um, not singular right yeah it's it's plural right and um so there there was did you notice the h number the the which no page oh, no when you when the doors what's the page number i, I did page number. i see i see the or not the page number but the strong's number yeah so 1817 so you can see i see a, a 187 in there yeah yeah which we've noticed before about doors, but um, mm. um, now, now doors here in, in Hebrew is just the, the fourth letter of the alphabet, a dalet, right? So that's, that's a drawing of a door. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know the significance of that other than, um, you know, we could relate it to the four, seven times as well because we know that this here is primarily about the 2520 but it's also about chiastic structures it's it's also about line upon line it's also about a doubling right um and it, it also refers back to this history so this so there is a um this idolatry that we see at gilgal and and that's where you know the ark uh, was right so you know where the tabernacle was so all of these things <coughs> are showing that this movement is needs to be reformed we also have a tarrying here um and uh, Iran just put up in uh, the chat there, the link to the 2010 prophetic chain documents. Um, now a lot happened at that uh, Oklahoma camp meeting that you can't really see that's in those documents. Uh, and, and the thing that impressed me the most about uh, Oklahoma was um, Jeff was doing a presentation and I, I can't remember what he was drawing on the line. Um, but it was, it showed a counterfeit line um, and somebody from uh, the congregation noticed it and pointed it out. And Jeff said, see, that's the work of the Holy Spirit working. And, um, and that, that impressed me because it's often, it's very rare that you see a speaker who's going to allow somebody to uh, present something and you know, the speakers usually want to be in control of what's happening. Uh, they're not open to light just coming from nobody. Uh, but Jeff was. And so that was the thing that impressed me about him. And if it wasn't for that, I don't know if I would have been too impressed by anything that happened at that camp meeting because I didn't know what was going on. So Iran says he can't find any videos from 2010. So they might exist somewhere. But... Um, Anyway, so we have all of this, this tarrying here. So we can see that this relates to the second angel's message in the tarrying time. Um, so if we were going to create a line of Uha, Ehud himself, I mean, we would have all of this, these symbols of a line. Um, and maybe that's one of the things we're going to have to do is take these three and, and create their own lines and see how they parallel. Um, so, so Ehud escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarry, quarries and escaped unto Sariath. Ser, 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 um, and then it says, it came to pass when he was come that he blew a tr 
trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he before them, and said unto them, Follow after, after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies and the Moabites into your hands. And they went down after him, and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab, and suffered not a man to pass over. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest fourscore years, right? And then we're going to have Shamgar, right? So with Shamgar, we just had these symbols uh, dealing with um, chronology, right? We had the plowing, the lines um, with this ox goad. And with the 600, we had this overplus, so one more than the five fingers of the hand. And we also had, um, uh, remember, Sam Shamgar meant a sword, right? And he's the son of Anath, which means to answer. So this is an answer that is given. Um, and and this answer, I, I think it, it relates to the disappointment itself. So there's a disappointment that happens there. And so when I go to these lines, what I put here is I'm going to put 2014, but it has a significance because in 2014, what occurs? You have the the separation of the path of the just and so forth. Yeah. Okay. So, and I'm going to put here October 22. That is actually the Wednesday during that Arkansas camp meeting. So I'm just going to put the middle date. So what, what ends up happening in 2014 is quite a few things. So we have the separation of the path of the just and all the other ministries. Um, it's going to be... Um, Jamal Sankey, who I think writes the letter, um, basically condemning Jeff. Uh, the ministries don't realize, um, you know, as people often don't, that when you try to do a coup, you can imagine you have a lot more support than you do because you only talk to the people that uh, support you. And uh, they definitely didn't have much support. They, didn't, they left pretty much empty-handed, unlike Parminder's movement which was more well thought out and, and planned um, and successful in that sense to a large degree. Um, and now also I present chronology for the first time in Alberta, but I've always marked, uh, I do present at this camp meeting in, in Arkansas and I do three presentations uh, on chronology. Um, and I believe I do, I'm trying to think of the dates. I think it's the 20th and the 21st. So I think I do either two on the 20th and one on the 21st. Uh, but it's going to be on the 22nd, the, the midst of the week there. That, that um, like Jeff is addressing, um, I'm trying to remember the title of this. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's the effect of every, Behold the Bridegroom Cometh, I think is the, the message. Um, but I mark the, the October 22 date. I mean, maybe that's a little bit arbitrary, but uh, I just thought it was significant. And so that's where I put this message uh, arrives, the third angel's message arrives. And it's going to be much more uh, connected to chronology. So even though these other ones are all leading to this because we have 9-11, the, the significance of that. And then we're going to have, uh, of course, the 2520. But we also now have this message of chronology introduced into the movement at a time when there is a disappointment, right, with all these ministries leaving. And, I mean, and this is the first camp meeting where these people are not going to be there as speakers. 
which originally they were planned to be there as speakers. So they would have been speaking at this camp meeting had it not been for the apostasy that occurred. So how is that looking for people? Because we only have like seven minutes left. Is this, is this making sense to people how we can take this way mark in this line, which is a way mark on the increase of knowledge of time, right? And, can't and see your can't see your chart. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. I have to hit share. <laughs> okay, so if you look at the chart, we can see that we're taking this way mark, which I've moved, you know, to 2014, right? So this is this way mark, um, which is an increase of knowledge, and we've zoomed into it, and we've created another reform line now exactly you know what dates you're going to take or uh, how you're going to look at that i think those those could be debated but um if we're going to uh to look at this line here we can see that this is logical based on what we've done in the past with abraham isaac and jacob and other lines and so Does that make sense, what we've done here? Even if you're going to quibble over some of the, the dates, exactly. Anybody with comments on this? I still feel a little unqualified to comment on these this timeline. Okay. especially since I didn't come in until 2012, but I have, you know, done a little bit of research and been listening to people talk about this subject, but I'm unqualified. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I do like the two Oklahomas there, the, it having two different way marks on this line. Because I think it serves that purpose. But also you can see sort of this progression of this movement where it leads up to the separation that's in the movement. Now, because there's so many other things happening, we know like in 2012, for instance, and this is going to be in, uh, like it's going to be at the end of March, the beginning of April, that Parminder is going to present his speculation about the Sunday law in 2014. Now, I don't hear about it until um, probably, you know, like a month after it happens or so, because Tabo moves in with me at the end of April. And, um, and Tabo, because I remember I was listening to uh, Dwayne Dewey's um, Desolation of Jerusalem uh, presentations. Um, you know, I don't, can't remember how I got them, uh, whether they, I don't think they were on YouTube because it was just an uh, audio recording, uh, if I remember. But anyway, so Tabo ends up moving in with me and he has this connection with Parminder. And, and at that time, I'm sharing lots on Facebook and there's this guy sharing what Parminder had been sharing. So I hear about this and Tabo's um, part of the secret Bible study group connected with Parminder. I guess Tess's mom is part of that as well in Australia. So there's this stuff going on um, at that time. So there's going to be this prediction about this Sunday law. But I've taken it that, that what Parminder's not really predicting the Sunday law, he's actually predicting what happens in 2014. That is, his, his analysis has to do with more separation in the movement than a Sunday law because it's internal. So, so we're gonna see that though in some of the other lines. That is, even though this line, we're not specifically marking out Parminder, when we look at the other judges, we can see that Parminder's message 
that these years are going to be parts of, are going to be way marks of part of another line. But here, this is about an increase of light. So the first, the first angel um, um, is, is always about an increase of light. And then there's this formalization of the message. So now I'm putting the formalization of the message here, Deborah and Barack, as you know, October 13th, 2018 to September 7th, 2019. But this is going to be about Parminder, the Sisera. And we're going to see that Parminder's message then is going to span this time going up to 11.9, right? And, and even to some degree beyond that. So, so we can see then when we look at Deborah and Barack tomorrow, we're going to draw this line. And if there's questions about the other line, we'll, we'll go over those first. But um, we're going to see then that these same years will show up again as different events marking those years. But they're still interrelated. Right. So these wheels within wheels are all interconnected. OK. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? OK, let's pray. Your father in heaven, once again, we are thankful for the time that we have had and for what you have shown us um, in your word. And we pray for each person again who is studying these things, that um, your Holy Spirit can enlighten our minds, strengthen us, and that we can walk in the light that is before us. We pray for these studies as we move towards a camp meeting in the summer. We know, Lord, that um, there's much that we have to learn and prepare. And we know, Lord, that um, you are bringing us together uh, to the upper room so that we can see our need of you, that we can confess our sins, that we can be united in doing this work. And so we pray for this unity that comes through obedience. Be with each person today. May your angels watch over them, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.